This podcast is brought to you by the North Dakota Petroleum Foundation. From heating our homes and powering our vehicles to cell phones, clothing, and medical equipment, oil and natural gas makes everyday life better. North Dakota Oil and Natural Gas, advancing the possibilities. Learn more at ndpetroleumfoundation.org. Welcome to the Plain Talk Podcast, and uh, in a moment, going to talk with uh, a gentleman who's been doing some polling uh, for an organization called Public Opinion Strategies. His name's Jim Hobart. He's been doing some polling about coal in the state of North Dakota, and I mean, obviously, because it's a public opinion survey, how the public feels about coal, which which matters. Um, I mean, we could talk about energy from the perspective of, um, you know, what works better, and there's all sorts of science that goes into the efficiency and all that. There's that. But there's also the political side of it. And, and like it or not, politics drives a lot of where we get our energy from. People have different attitudes about it. Those attitudes get reflected in who we elect to, to uh, regulatory offices, who we elect to legislative offices, who we elect to executive branch offices. Uh, and then those elected leaders make decisions based on public opinion as well. So we're going to talk about that in just a moment. But before we get there, my usual admonishment, uh, thank you for everybody who's been tuning in and downloading. Um, as always, I really appreciate it. Uh, one thing that really helps the show out, if you leave a review for the podcast on whatever platform you're listening on, Spotify recently enabled uh, reviews. If you leave, a, leave an honest review of the podcast, however you're listening to it, that really helps. Also remember, uh, if you're if you're streaming this on Facebook or something, if that's the way you like to listen, hey, that's great. Um, but if you want to be notified of new episodes as they pop up, remember if you use a podcasting app like a Spotify, like Pocket Cast, like Podcast Addict, there's a million of them out there. If you subscribe that way, you get a notification on your phone or whatever device whenever there's a new episode and you can tune in right away. Also, don't forget, I write for a living as well. If you would subscribe to, uh, and, and really you could subscribe to any of our newspapers. We have dozens of them, uh, including four dailies in the state of North Dakota. If you go to any of these, these one, all any of our news websites, <coughs> and you subscribe, geez, I'm coughing. Uh, if, you, if you go to any of our news websites and you subscribe, you get access to all of them for one low monthly rate of ten dollars it doesn't really matter which one you subscribe on inforum.com forward slash subscribe is an easy place to go but grand forks herald jamestown sun dickinson press um i don't know the the, the duluth news tribune any of them um you subscribe to one you get them all and again it's 10 bucks a month what a deal all right we're gonna go to our mat my guest jim hobart public opinion strategies and jim first of all tell us about this survey um you know tell us the specifics of of what you were measuring Sure. So did the survey for the Lignite Energy Council. I've been doing polling for them in North Dakota for a number of years now. Uh, it was a statewide survey, 400 likely voters in the state, uh, conducted December 2 through 5, 2021. So just at the beginning of December, so a little more than a month ago, six weeks or so. And uh, folks always ask, hey, well, I've got a cell phone now. No one. Uh, so polls only call landlines. Certainly not the case. We did of the 400 interviews, 135 were with landline respondents and another 265 were with cell phone respondents in the state. And in terms of the purpose of the poll, it was really just to look at the public sentiment on the energy industry in the state, and then also to test a few specific projects that the energy industry has, has been working on and, and is continuing to do. It, it was really some interesting results. First of all, I'm, I'm reading now from the polling memo that, that, that you published. 72% um, of North Dakota voters are supportive of using coal to produce electricity in the state, um, including close to half who strongly favor it. Um, a similar number of, uh, similar number, 66% of voters uh, support continuing to mine coal in North Dakota for the next 50 years. Um, and th this was really interesting as well. Uh, voters are strongly in favor of research and development projects that would update existing lignite coal-based power plants. Overwhelming majority of North Dakotans, 81%, are supportive of projects, um, of those projects, um, that includes 95% of Republicans, 84% of independents, and even a majority of Democrats at 51%. Um, that's a consensus, uh, it seems like to me. Definitely. Yeah, no, th th there's no doubt about that. And, and a couple of things to touch on. One thing that's really important in public opinion polling that we pay a lot of attention to that's certainly true here is what we call intensity of support. 
for example, you mentioned close to half, 47% are strongly in favor of using coal to produce electricity in the state. That's what we call a good or strong intensity number. And we see that type of intensity pretty consistently on these topics. Sometimes on, on public policy issues, you have voters who are very supportive, but they're more kind of lukewarm. They're like, yeah, I'm in favor of this, but you get numbers like 25% strongly favor and then 40% somewhat favor. On these issues in North Dakota, you don't see that, which I, I think really speaks to the, the understanding of just how important the energy industry is to the state's economy. Well, it's, it's the difference between yeah, I feel a certain way, and yeah, I feel that way so strongly it's going to motivate me to go to the polls and vote in a certain way. Um, exactly. That, that seems to be the distinction. Carbon capture also has a lot of support, and and not surprisingly. I mean, we're seeing our elected leaders from Governor Doug Burgum, Senator John Hoven, Senator Kevin Kramer, Congressman Kelly Armstrong. They have been extremely supportive in, in promoting policies with, with carbon capture, and, and perhaps not surprisingly, their constituents seem to want carbon capture. Um, more than three quarters, 76 percent of voters in the state are in favor of using carbon capture compared to just 17 percent who are opposed, um, which is pretty remarkable because that, that's a big emerging technology. And, and we're going to see it, it's not just carbon capture at plants, but North Dakota has another industry in the storage part of that where we're seeing um, a, a pipeline project that would gather carbon from ethanol plants across the region. Uh, and and bring that to North Dakota for sequestration underground. Um, you know, and obviously when you're building a pipeline project, much like with oil pipeline projects, those are always difficult, right? Because you're intersecting property rights. You know, you're interse- there's always a lot of battles around that, and rightfully so. That's an arduous process because you're building a pipeline across somebody's property. In fact, lots of people's properties, lots of interests there, and it should be an arduous process. But to see such a strong, such strong public opinion numbers around carbon capture tells you that those projects are probably going to go through pretty well. Yeah, yeah, I think that's definitely the case. And what's particularly noteworthy is, as you mentioned, yeah, you've got 76% of voters who are in favor of carbon capture, but that's also a pretty sizable increase from what we saw back in September of 2019. Then it was 61%. That's a good number, but getting up to 76% is a pretty big boost. And I think, as you mentioned, look, it's something that both the elected officials in the state, the governor, both the state senators, the state's member of Congress, and then also you're seeing that the end industry itself really make a big push for these types of projects inform the electorate why these types of projects are are important and beneficial to the state and for that reason you're seeing the movement in the numbers and again you know here you do see this really bipartisan support as as i joke that there are such things as bipartisan issues these days <laughs> you just you just have to find it right you look at carbon capture it's 74 percent of republicans 74 percent of independents and 81 percent of democrats really almost no gap there on, on the carbon capture and storage technology in terms of partisan support that's um that's that's pretty remarkable and, and it, it speaks volumes because I was going to ask you about the trends. I have the polling memo for this most recent poll, but I was going to ask you about the trends on some of this stuff. You're mentioning that that support for carbon capture went higher. And I think that's interesting because as somebody who writes about this stuff and obviously follows the news of it, carbon capture has kind of gone, at least from the public's perception, has gone from kind of a pie in the sky thing that maybe people maybe may or may not have even heard of to a reality like it's here like there's a pipeline project coming we're talking about coal creek station um you know that being a very big part of that that coal-fired power plant continuing to operate we're talking you know, we're hearing all sorts of carbon capture governor burgum is talking about it as as an emerging industry for our state so i would argue that north dakotans in this survey probably know more about carbon capture than they did in the previous survey and the approval for it went up that's a really good sign for proponents of carbon capture. Right. And I think that's what's a sign of it. And I like that term pie in the sky. You know, when, you know, three, four, five years ago, when voters are hearing about carbon capture, they, there's just not a lot of knowledge behind it. And it's like, hey, you know, is this something that we really want to do? What exactly does it mean? You know, uncertainty breeds lower polling numbers, right? Because you're like, hey, what exactly is this going to mean for me? Uh, but now, like you said, Voters are more aware of what it means and they understand that, hey, this is an exciting new technology. This isn't a scary new technology. And it's a new technology that can really benefit benefit the state and help it continue to be an energy leader in the country. Yeah. I mean, not not just can it not just can it it make our existing industries better. 
um, whether it's coal or oil or or ethanol or, or any of the a- agriculture. I mean, there's a lot of applications for that. We're just, I think, seeing the tip of the iceberg. Not only going to make those better, but it's also creating a new industry, right? So, you know, there's people that got to work on those pipelines. There's people that got to work at the sequestration process. I mean, it's 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 more jobs and more prosperity. And, and we can bring other states' carbon to our state and store it for them. Um, one of the other things, surveys, that one of the other, uh, I guess, public opinions that your survey measured was um, support for using carbon dioxide that is stored underground to produce additional oil in the state. Now, this is something where, where they take that carbon dioxide and they inject it down into the, into the well, and it, it enhances oil recovery. They can essentially use the carbon. Not only are they putting it down underground so it's not being released into the air, but it's also pushing out more oil and, and enhancing the oil recovery. And, and this really surprised me. You found strong support, 76% of voters back using carbon dioxide um, in that way for, for, for enhanced oil recovery. But but the partisan breakdowns are, are remarkable. 88% of Republicans, 64% of independents, 60% of Democrats. Um, that's that's pretty remarkable, Jim. Yeah, no, no, it certainly is. And again, I, I think it speaks to, you know, especially when you see the numbers among Democrats, it's an understanding of, hey, how important the oil industry is to the state in North Dakota, right? Um, and it's also an understanding and, and successful messaging, frankly, that, that voters understand that this is a technology that can be done safely, right? Uh, you know, w- when voters sometimes hear about things being stored underground, that, that makes them nervous. It's clear that the North Dakota folks who advocate for these types of new technology have shown voters that, hey, there, there's nothing to be nervous about. This can be done safely. This can be done securely. And it can be done in a way that, that's going to be beneficial to, to everyone in the state. There's always a lot of variables that go into why somebody has the opinion that they do. Right. And those those can be almost as unique as fingerprints sometimes. But I, I wonder if what's driving a lot of this is I I have always felt that North Dakotans have a very pragmatic because it's it's a historically agrarian state, they have a very pragmatic view of land use, um, which is to say that that when you're a farmer or a rancher, you have two simultaneous goals. One, you want to make a living from the land, right? You want to take prosperity out of the land and, and prosper and profit for yourself. Um, but then the other part of that is you also have to take care of the land because next year's car, uh, harvest or the harvest 10 years down the road or the harvest 50 years down the road depends on your stewardship of the land today and i think north dakotans are very very used to balancing those two things saying we want to use the land but we also want to take care of the land and i'm wondering if that's not translating into what we're seeing in the survey results like this where we're saying listen we can mine coal responsibly in north dakota we've been doing it for generations we can continue doing it there's nothing wrong with this we can do this when i'm seeing these strong numbers across even even partisan divides which as you said in this political environment we're living in Everybody's divided about everything, and yet here we're finding in North Dakota, no, Republican, Democrat, Independent, um, everybody feels remarkably similar about these issues. I, I think I wonder if that doesn't have its roots in North Dakota's agrarian history. I, I think there's there's definitely some truth to that, and I think the other reality right now that, that is, you know, seeing these numbers go even higher is that, hey, guess what we have right now? We've got high energy prices. Uh, we've got high gas prices, and, and because of that, you know, getting back to that pragmatism you mentioned, voters are saying, hey, you know, what's the best way to lower energy prices? Well, one way is to produce additional oil in the state. Um, what's one way to make my energy prices go even higher? It's, it's to limit the production of coal in the state. So there, there's an also an understanding from voters that, hey, they're, they're frustrated with, with the price of everything right now. Um, energy included and, and one way to bring that down is through producing more energy tell me about you you talked a little bit about the the change in in the numbers for carbon capture where they, they improved more people you, you started with a strong majority and got an even stronger majority in favor of it talk about the attitudes about like coal development and, and some of these other issues in general in north dakota i mean how has that been evolving because we've seen i mean we've seen some tough years for the coal industry where where people are it's, it's become a political hot button issue in a lot of ways. Um, how has that changed in North Dakota? You know, it, it's really support for the industry has been really remarkably steady. Uh, you know, you've been at at or around, you know, 
three quarters of support, you know, plus or minus a, a few, you know, some years we might be at 77 percent. This survey we're at 72 percent. But but it really has been consistent. You, you have seen some fluctuation bipartisanship, uh, you know, no surprise. Democrats are less enthusiastic about using coal than they were six, seven years ago. Uh, but what you have also seen is you've seen Republicans and independents become even more supportive of the industry because, look, you know, like so many other issues, coal has become a, a put on your partisan jersey issue. If you're a Republican, you're very much in favor of it. If you're a Democrat, you're more opposed to it. And so, uh, you know, we've seen that. But because guess what? There's more Republicans in North Dakota than there are Democrats. You've seen it be pretty steady because for the for the increase in opposition among Democrats, you've also seen a, a, a similar increase in support among Republicans. I, I'm wondering if and, and this is something uh, speaking maybe geographically here, because I, I think the impulse is to say, well, of course, North Dakota is a coal state. Coal's good for North Dakota's economy. Of course, people in a coal state are going to say this. So I'm, I'm wondering, yeah, I mean, maybe that makes sense if if you're asking somebody in Mercer County or Oliver County in central North Dakota, you know, how do you feel about the coal industry? Chances are they probably work for the coal industry or have someone that they love or that they know who does work for the coal industry or their business depends on, you know, the the the, the impact of, of the coal industry on the local economy. So that's maybe not surprising. But most of North Dakota's voters live in places like Fargo and Grand Forks, which are geographically pretty removed from the coal industry and probably don't have anywhere near the direct economic impact from coal mining or from coal plants that, you know, people who live in central North Dakota do. So, I mean, what, what do you, I mean, it, it, my contention would be that we're seeing such strong statewide support. We're talking about strong majority of the voters supporting this stuff. Um, and yet most of, I'm, I'm assuming your, your poll is probably weighted geographically to take into account that most voters live in, in the urban centers like Fargo, Grand Forks, Bismarck, urban by North Dakota standards. I'm doing, <laughs> I'm doing air quotes around that, but, but those are our big communities in the state. Most of the voters live there. Your poll was, was, I'm, you can tell me if I'm wrong, was, was weighted, uh, I'm assuming towards those communities. And yet we're still seeing these strong majorities. I'm wondering, it's, it's not just about, oh, North Dakota, North Dakotans work for the coal industry, so of course they're pro-coal. It's more complicated than that. Right. No, I mean, look, yes, you, yes, the survey was weighted geographically to uh, a likely North Dakota electorate. Um, and yeah, you know what? Voters in the western part of the state, the more rural communities, sure, are they a little more supportive of coal? Yes, you know, they might be up at 78, 79, 80 percent. But guess what? You know, you can do the math just as well as I can. If it's 72 percent overall, then in those urban centers, as you mentioned, using the air quotes, um, the numbers are pretty strong there, too. You know, you're, you're still seeing north of two thirds of support in the communities that are more removed from the coal industry. And again, I, you know, you, you touched some on this earlier, but but North Dakotans just have a, a real understanding of the, the industries that that help the state, right? It, it, it's a smaller state. It, it's not a state where, you know, you've got one whole big industry in, in one part and then, you know, the other one, it's not a state where the right hand doesn't know where the, what the left hand is doing, so to speak. And, and so there, there's certainly an acknowledgement and understanding that, that the coal industry and the energy industry as a whole in the state is is the rising tide that, that lift all, lifts all boats, whether or not you are personally connected to the industry uh, or not. Well, Jim, I appreciate it. The, the the polling, the survey is is interesting stuff. Um, as a matter of fact, when I when I post this uh, this column on on um, when I post it online, or this podcast, I should say, I will um, I'll include the um, the polling memo because I think it's pretty interesting numbers. And and again, I mean, we're debating this stuff. I think we're all trying to find a path forward. That that divide that I talked about earlier that I think I think ranchers and farmers know so well, which is how do we use this resource while simultaneously protecting our resources, our, our land and our air and everything else. And, um, you know, I, I think there, there's a pragmatism here that, that's showing up in North Dakota that's that's very heartening. Jim, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Yeah, Rob, really appreciate it. Have a great rest of your day. Well, that was some interesting numbers about the coal industry from Jim Hobart. And, and again, the, the public opinion matters when it comes to energy because the people who make energy policy are – for the most part, elected. So how the public feels about these things matters, and, and those are certainly some very interesting numbers about how North Dakota feels when it comes to things like, like coal development. And I would argue even more importantly for North Dakota's future, 
carbon capture, which, which again, I agree with Governor Doug Burgum entirely. That is an emerging industry for our state. Anyway, now we're going to switch gears, going to talk with Grand Forks Mayor Brandon Bochensky. Now, the reason why I wanted to have Brandon on is recently the University of North Dakota, uh, it came to light. And, and in fact, I, I'm, I'm, I think I was the first one to write about this back in October where I had I had got my hands on a draft copy of of the rule. And I, and I want to be very, very clear. This is not a rule that's been implemented. This is still a draft. This is still an ongoing debate within within UND. So this is not anything that they've done. Um, this is something that's being considered. And I, I, I think part of the problem, though, is when I wrote about this in October, they had had a public comment period for this rule that was over like two days after my column ran. Like it was already in process when I, somebody who was reviewing it, you know, sent it to me and I, I wrote about it. Uh, and by the time, um, you know, interested parties like the North Dakota Catholic Conference agree or disagree with their point of view, they obviously have an interest in this in this policy by the time they got around to, to to maybe having a say on it the public comment period was already over and there was a feeling i i think that this was kind of being done below the radar and being pushed ahead too quickly now more recently und president andrew armacost uh, re responding i think to criticism from the catholic conference and others has uh, has said that they're gonna i, I don't know I, I think maybe slow the process down maybe he would argue that that they weren't speeding it up in the first place. But my, that was my perception is that they're maybe going to slow the process down. And I should probably tell you what this rule is about. It's about transgender students on on campus and how they're going to be incorporated into the larger campus culture. Now, some of the things, this, this draft policy, and again, this could change, this may not even be implemented, but some of the things it talks about are um, you know, use of university facilities and not just bathrooms, but... But locker rooms, right? I mean, a bathroom is one thing where maybe everybody has their own stall. You know, a locker room is a is a different environment. Also, pronoun use. If you intentionally misgender somebody or you don't use their preferred pronouns, you could face discipline from the University of North Dakota. Now, the, the Catholic Conference is opposing the policy, and when they sent out a letter recently to their supporters, Mayor Pruchensky, uh came out and, and supported the letter, uh, posted a a Facebook message about it. Um, I'm going to quote from that. He said, I quote, compelling speech and forcing ideology on our students, our children, and our community is abhorrent. Is it possible for a university to focus on academic rigor and preparing our youth to enter the workforce with the skills of adulthood? A sad day for my alma mater. Now, Brandon, first of all, thanks for your time. Thanks for coming on. And what caught your eye about this issue? What made you feel like you needed to speak out? Yeah, thanks for having me. I think you did a great job of sort of surmising uh, the situation. Um, really, I was probably in the same lines with, with what you had talked about and just the transparency factor. Um, I didn't know a whole lot about it. I know I had read some articles. You, you can't find this policy anywhere on their website. It's very difficult. Actually, um, reading the letter from the Catholic, Com Catholic Conference, um, and that's where I actually found it. It was on their website, not on the university website. Um, so I think it lacks some transparency. And I I had some concerns, uh, you know, regarding the facility use, the housing use, uh, some free speech use, um, and uh, just the transparency in general. So I felt like it was an opportunity to get it out there. I know I had spoken with a number of uh, local legislators that that had some uh, some meetings and asked for it to be put out there more so people knew about it because people just didn't know about it. Um, and that was frustrating, I think, for them, frustrating for me. So I felt, you know, here's a way to get it out publicly and open the conversation. And it certainly has, that's for sure. Yeah, Chris Dodson from the Catholic conference. And I, I just want to be clear, like I'm, I'm, I'm an atheist personally, so I'm, I don't really have a dog in, in their fight. Um, right. but, but I mean, I have an interest obviously in the policy at the university of North Dakota, Chris, Chris Dodson, he's the legal counsel for the, the Catholic conference. Um, he actually sent me an email after my October column went up and, and this was the, that was the first he had heard about it as well. So I, I, th I think there was kind of a, uh, you know, a, a feeling that they were going to try to push this through under the radar and maybe they didn't want to have a public debate about this. But, uh, you know, I, I don't, I, I think the thing is, is this is some very, very consequential stuff for uni the University of North Dakota and, and the state of North Dakota insofar as, you know, the UND, I, I think um, Senator Ray Holmberg, long-term term state lawmaker um, from Grand Forks, you know, w one of the things he noted is that probably other other universities would would seek to emulate this 
in the future. Now, now, Brandon, one one thing that you said that I thought was very interesting is you felt that by UND pushing this policy, it was kind of sending the message that that Grand Forks and, and UND aren't already a, a welcoming community. That that rankled you a little bit, it seemed to me. Yeah, I mean, you, I, I think this kind of comes to the, the, the sort of the progressive tip of the spear ideology that they constantly have to, to push, you know, further and further into, um, I would say you could even talk, you know, race and, and sexual orientation, all these things. And the, the bar of what is discriminatory or harassment has been brought in so low that generally, you know, people are pretty nice and you're just not seeing a ton of these reports. Um, you hear about it, you hear about it secondhand and everyone has a story about this discrimination harassment but it's just on day to day i just don't i see north dakota as being a friendly place that really is a live and let live type of state and to continually hear that we need these policies because um, we have such a big problem uh, to me i take uh, take issue with that because i just don't see that as the case and i know i'm not see that you know we're there to see everything but largely i think we have a community that is pretty friendly pretty welcoming and a really safe uh, inclusive environment to begin with my understanding is, and, and again, I, I don't have all the data in front of me, but but I, I think anytime somebody proposes a public policy, whether it's like an administrative policy like this or a piece of legislation, the first place my mind goes to is, what's the scope of the problem? Um, what, what, what are we trying to solve? You know, show me, like, if, 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 if too many people are slipping on banana peels on the sidewalk... You know, my, you know, we're going to pass a law about, you know, making it illegal to throw banana. That's probably already illegal under later laws. But you know what I'm saying? Like, how many people are slipping on banana peels before we need to, like, ban bananas or something, right? Like, that's where you have to start. Like, before you do anything else, what's the scope of the problem? And I'm I'm looking, and I'm, I don't, I mean, I, I think there's people out there who say that there's a problem, but but how many complaints are filed, right? I mean, how many, do we have incidents of harassment? And, and also, why, if, if somebody's being harassed or or anything like that, and, and, and I want to make sure to put this caveat in, and I'm, I'm sure Brandon agrees with me, every single person in Grand Forks, every person at the University of North Dakota, every person in the United States of America, every person in the world deserves to be treated with dignity and respect. Um, just full stop. They're human beings. That's how they deserve to be treated. But I, I, I agree fully. And that's that's where I try to point yeah. out that in the student code of life, it, it already has provisions for that. And that is inclusive of everybody. That means a person who believes um, that there's more of a connection between um, gender and biological um, sex and someone that doesn't. They should both be able to be free to not be discriminated or harassed against. And I think if you're just creating an environment where individuals are only allowed um, to use what somebody else tells them to use and not to question that at all is troublesome. But with that being said, you also cannot harass or discriminate against anybody. And I, I think we can all stand behind that, rally against it and fight for that. Yeah, I, I think that's that's the distinction that sometimes gets gets lost in, in this debate. Yeah. But I and I get but I guess that's my question for the university is why why aren't existing policies about harassment insufficient for this? Right. I mean, if if somebody's going, you know, following a transgender student around saying hateful things to them, I have to think that that's already against UND policy. I mean, what what more policy do we need? Uh, you know, that that's, well, that's part of the problem yeah. I'm having with this. Well, and, and I think that's right where I'm at. And I think the, the when you have people that you've hired, though, that their full time job is diversity, equity and inclusion, um, they have to provide doc. They have to provide you know progressive ideas and progressive things because otherwise, how do they justify? It? You know, you've almost to me, if you're not having a whole lot of cases of discrimination and harassment, then you've done a phenomenal job and you have a welcoming community. But there's this sense you have to keep pushing the you know pushing the needle further, even if there isn't maybe something there. So in that press conference, they they did say there's been zero formal reports or formal complaints. There had been reports, and whether they meant that in a true written report way or just hearing a report. Um, you know, they weren't fully clear on that, but with zero things reaching to the level of formal complaint, it did seem like um, they were searching a bit and trying to find a, uh, you know, a solution that didn't have as much of a problem. I don't know. My, my, my sense sometimes is that we do these things because they become political hot button issues. Like we have, we have something that's go, we're having a debate that's going on nationally or something. And so local people feel like, well, we need to inject ourselves into that debate. We need to be a part of that debate. And it almost becomes, is, is fad to, to, I mean, it almost seems like fad policy to me. Does it strike you that way as well? I don't know if it's, yeah, I mean, fad or, or knee jerk. I mean, these are conversations that we're having nationally. Do we, 
do we, uh, did I really want to get and insert it into this, this conversation? Um, no, but I, if the university that, that I went to, it's within our city. Um, and I feel like they're, you know, they're not, you know, being transparent. Then that's where I felt like I had to get involved, but did I really want to be involved in this? I think it's, it's hard because the moment you question even a, a policy, the, the, I would say the woke or the far left automatically assumes that you hate and you're against everything to do with it. Now, somehow you're totally against transgender uh, people and you're, you're pushing them down. That's why I think these fads and, and interjecting it and this sort of, like I said before, the tip of, se of the spear progressivism wants completely complete and utter obedience and loyalty to what they say. And I think that's the, the troublesome part. So whether it's a fad or not, it brings this in where you can't even question it. I, can you imagine a student or a faculty member even questioning this policy? Um, if you look at, uh, you know, Facebook and the, you know, there's massively mean comments on both sides after I post this. And I obviously, oh, I was, you know, was going to ask you, what what has the response been like after you, after you made this statement? Yeah, I think, you know, there's some, some people that were definitely supportive. Um, you know, they, they dissected everything that the Catholic religion has stated and said, no, you, you are now supporting everything the Catholic religion stated. And I said, no, that's not the case. Just the way I read the policy was, was, I, I had similar beliefs in what their statement but it's been uh, on both sides. But I mean, you know, keep in mind, um, you know, I was trying to tell people Facebook, Twitter, uh, maybe even David Chappelle said this. It's it's, of course, not the real world. So let's right. realize that uh, uh, Facebook and that isn't what isn't reality. So it's been mean on both sides. I would I wish there had just been um, good debate on both sides of the uh, of this topic without people getting nasty and mean and calling other people, uh, you know, bad names on both sides, quite frankly. Have you spoken to, to UND President Armacost about this? Yeah, we spoke. I, I, and like I said, I, I didn't want to go out and, and try to put him in a bad spot, but I felt that there was a lack of transparency. We did speak, um, and, uh, you know, he said there's some things that he that they wanted to further clarify, which I think they did on the housing. It's still difficult if you read the policy on use of facilities and housing. Um, it wasn't quite clear. It really, it really uh, in, in my opinion, shaped that anyone was going to be housed with the uh, – how they express their identity and, you know, whether or not you wanted to be housed with somebody um, that lived or that believed that you were going to be. And it, to me, it seemed that if you said, I don't want to be that you're now discriminating. So it had some nuance that was, was interesting, but he said they plan to clear that up at the press conference. And I think they, whether they back puddled or cleared some of that up on housing, I do think they addressed at least that part of it. You do bring up an interesting point where in, in this environment, if you, if you object to something like like pronouns, like you say, and and I should say my personal policy, I'm I try to you know if I run into a situation like that, I'm going to try to address somebody the way they want to be addressed. You know, also understanding that I'm 41 years old, I've been using the language a certain way most of my life. I'm probably going to make mistakes or I'm going to forget, and I hope they understand that I'm going to make a good faith effort to to respect that from them. If that's what they want from me. It costs me nothing to be polite, right? I, I wish more people would remember this. It costs you nothing to be polite. Um, so that's what I'm going to try. But I worry that, that somebody who just comes out and says, well, gosh, I don't know. I think I think maybe opening up a locker room to somebody who just says that they identify with a certain agenda could cause some problems. Now suddenly you're anti-trans. And I think that's, so un that's such an unfortunate part of this debate where if you implement a policy like this, I think it becomes difficult to even even voice concern or or criticism without being lumped in with with bigots. Yeah, I don't think you're allowed to provide any skepticism um, or uh, or scrutiny. I think that yeah, you're exactly. It goes to the other extreme. So I think uh, that's concern, and I've obviously seen that. And I probably, you know, looking back and 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 getting it out there and trying. I hate the shock value, and I hate that I I didn't mean to present with a a shock value in what I wrote. I, I probably, uh, you know, just tend to be, um, when I believe in things, pretty vigorously believe in them. So I, there was probably a little more vigor than needed to be there in my You're, statement, you're direct. I you're cool. blunt. I run into the same problem. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Have, I have all the subtlety of an avalanche. So um. Yeah. Well, if I could do it over again, I probably would have been less blunt, as you put it. That's probably a good word. Um, and now I've been lumped in with that, you know, a, a close-minded, uh, knuckle-dragging uh, a hockey player that just wants to hit people with, their, with their, his stick, which is... Uh, you know, just as insulting on the other side of it, but I digress. You know, it's it's interesting because I, I I think this is almost a microcosm for what we're going through in 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 lar our larger life in in America. Where I mean, you're obviously I write about politics. You're you're involved in politics. You're an elected official, and and a lot of it. There, there's so many people who seem to think that 
it's all about just imposing your will on the other people, right? And like, if I if I win, if I get this law through, or I get this candidate through, and then after that, you know, I've won. And I, I think what we forget is that we still got to live next to each other, right? So so after the University of North Dakota, if, if they if they do end up promulgating this policy, I think they have to do so with the mind that all the people who are critical of it, all the people who are skeptical of it, who don't like it for various reasons, they're still going to be part of the Grand Forks community, part of the UND community, right? They're still they're still going to exist. And I, I, I think that's why it's maybe the lesson is it's so incumbent upon us to try to find policy solutions that we can all live with, not I feel this way and I have the numbers in this political moment. I have the legislative majority or I I control the, 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 the whatever the process is that's making the policy. So therefore, I won and you're just going to have to live with it. I feel like that attitude is tearing us apart as, as a country. Well, yeah, I think it's nobody can disagree. And we're being pulled so far to the left or the right that the, the center has just it seems like it's no place to live anymore because you're and then you're attacked by by both sides. Uh, but I, I think you're right um, on the policy side. We shouldn't be creating policies to be able to go. We should, policies should be created should should somewhat be a win for everybody. If it's created and it's debated, it should somewhat be a win for everybody. If you're only fighting for it so you can say yes, I beat down that ideology um, or that um, political stance, um, then you're, you're you're creating policy for the wrong reason. And and I think we've gotten to a place now where. You've seen on the national level. We need this win. This is a win for us if we can win this, and that'll you know we'll push. Well, every, everything, now. everything too is like in terms of the world ending, right? Like if we don't yeah. pass this policy, terrible things are going to happen. Or if we if we do pass this policy, terrible things are going to happen. I mean, everything to to quote Spinal Tap, everything is turned <laughs> up to eleven all the time, and it's it's you know I, which I think kind of bothered me about this is there's this argument where we have to pass this this policy at UND because people are being harassed but yet the obvious question is well where's the evidence right and i i feel terrible if, if anybody's been made to feel bad about themselves or has actually been harassed or whatever i don't want that to happen to anybody but the world's a tough place and if you didn't file a formal complaint we don't have any way of measuring that by the data we have available to us there doesn't seem to be a problem at und which already has expansive policies about harassment so why are we I, I guess, why are we picking a fight we don't have to fight? Which is a great thing. I mean, that's a great story that we've got a very inclusive and that you don't have people. And I, they point to the mental health issues. There's there's mental health issues in a lot of different areas right now. There's obviously mental health, health issues in the in the uh, non-conforming gender community. There's mental health issues with our, our military and veterans, with our police, even recently with our pilots at UND. These, there's all mental health issues. And I think that's troublesome. We don't want people to have to feel bad and to have to have something else thrown on their lap. We're all in this together. We're all just trying to get through this, trying to figure it out the best we can while we're here on this earth. Whether you believe in God or anything or not, we're all here together for a little while. Let's figure out a way to make it work. Exactly. I mean, that's the beautiful thing about America is how different um, we all are. Uh, and that's yeah. really unique for, for, for a lot of a lot of countries in the world. I mean, you, you think of I don't know what you want. This is a very antiquated word, but like old old world countries. I, I've always argued that it's like it's like the United States of America is if if you can think of life as a video game, it's like we're playing on a harder difficulty setting than a lot of other places because we've been so open because we allow so many people from so many different parts of the world. It's a part of our history. You know, colonization was a part of that. We brought some people here that didn't want to come here in the first place. That's obviously been a very difficult part of our history. We've had immigration wave after wave after wave for years. It makes it harder for everybody. Um, but the thing is, is, I mean, we should lean into that difficulty, right? Because it, it's stemming from the very thing that makes us great. I, and I think, uh, I, well, I agree with you on that point. I mean, I lived for eight years in Kazakhstan and they were not pushing the, the uh, you know, these types of ideologies and, and growth and sort of the collective thought that the Western world has. It was a very closed down place, very totalitarian, very authoritarian. Um, and it was difficult, you know, a largely Muslim place. I lived there for eight years and got to see what that was like. And being back here, I couldn't never, I could always, I could just not wait to be back home because it, you could feel the freedom. You could just feel um, this ability that uh, everybody had a, a seat at the table. We all had hope. And they didn't feel that there. So it was always, it just felt like you were breathing a different air when you came back here. And I, I'm always grateful, um, you know, to be born here, to be able to experience that and to be a part of it. 
um, good, bad, or otherwise, um, we're, we're all we're all part of the same experiment, and it's it's working better than a lot of other places. Zooming out from this issue a little bit, you're a first term mayor. How's it how's it going? <laughs> Oh, I think it's been going pretty good, you know, and I'm learning too. You know, realistically, um, I probably learned a lesson about getting, uh, you know, involved in national things when uh, I've, I've largely stayed out of that and just tried to focus on uh, infrastructure, public safety, and, and local things. So I'm figuring out as I go, but I think we've got a lot of good things going here, and I'm uh, I'm trying to uh, to wake up with a smile on my face every day and then do the best I can. If you knew the COVID-19 thing was going to happen, would you still run for mayor? <laughs> I think I would have. I, I think I was able to give some balance to that. Uh, um, and I think Grand Forks, actually our state came out, or is, you know, we're still in it, but I think we've we've managed it uh, better than most. I would just leave it at that. I think we've done pretty well. Um, well, Brandon, I, I appreciate your time so much, and uh, have a great rest of your day. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for having me on. Really appreciate it. Take care.